Hello, this is Wendy. Welcome, fellow seekers, to this video. Happy spring. It's March 21st of 2022. Happy spring to you, or happy autumn to you. Uh, new, a new season is upon us. And I want to uh, finish up my series that I've made on the Mariel Tarot. This is the second edition. I'll show some cards and I'll try to talk at the same time. We'll see if I can do it. And I made three other videos about this deck and one about my disdain for the guidebook. And I do a comparison, uh, an unfair comparisons video between this, the Thoth and the Rider Waite Smith. And I talk about another video about the first and second editions. And I decided that I uh, was, I, and I worked with it uh, for a while. I've been working with it for a while, asking this deck all kinds of questions, mundane questions, philosophical questions, just to get a feel for it. And uh, about a week ago, I was talking to a friend about uh, free will in the world. Should you use, should you have free will does, you know, uh, in, from a witchcraft perspective about free will and manifestation and uh, in relation to the free will of other people. And so I asked this deck, so, so we were having that conversation and then I asked this deck about free will. What can you tell me about free will? Or, that's how I phrase it or something to that effect. I was shuffling and I used Julie from Peekaboo Rose's shuffling method because the this gilding is very sharp. So I use her method. I'll leave, leave a link to her video below. And so and and I shuffle it overhand. I do an overhand shuffle to get a little fresh energy in there. Uh, I feel that's very important when doing when reading cards. So I, I was doing a little shuffling and while I was shuffling, and let's keep in mind we're talking about free will. I this card this card fell out. The six of discs. And so sometimes when cards fall out, I leave them out and sometimes I don't. I, it's just sort of a, you know, it's an, like everything with tarot and metaphysical things, it's an intuitive process. So this card fell out, I put it to the side. And this is uh, Angel Gabriel. All of Murray White's sixes are angels. And so I, and I did my dice method. I broke it into two piles and then I pulled this card, the six of cups. So these two cards, and this is earth and this is water. And the, and both of these cards in the guidebook talk about free will, the manifest, the creation, uh, free will from a, a, a creative way in a physical, you know, you could even say physical love in a, and, in, in almost a sex magic kind of way, <laughs> uh, which I hadn't thought about that till right now. So that's interesting. And a six of cups in terms of a, a subconscious conscious bringing your will into the world. And this Mary White's deck is very Abrahamic, I would say. And almost in the way of it's your duty as a, as a being that's been created, you want to come to your free will to come to to fruition and create your own, you know, create new creations. Uh, when I, when I pulled that, I was like, wow, you know, that's amazing, you know, in terms of free will. And as I have stated before, I've been asking this deck all kinds of questions and some questions mundane, some of more philosophical, some personal, you know, all, I try to throw, throwing all these questions at this deck. And I've been thinking about this deck in terms of tarot as living beings. I had been thinking about it for a few weeks. And that's a Crowley, you know, in Crowley's Book of Thoth, he talks about tarot as living beings. And in, in this deck, in terms of the, the, the images themselves, when you look at them, or they look at you, you know, they're so, this deck is so evocative and it's almost like they're, the deck is trying to impose its will on you sometimes. You know, it's so powerful. I asked this, and so I've been thinking, so I've been thinking about this idea of tarot as living beings. And I had, Paul Hughes Barlow has a video about tarot, uh, tarot as living beings. I'll link that below. Paul Hughes Barlow uh, has been on YouTube for about 10 years. He's uh, has a lot of thought, videos about Thoth and Crowley and... Um, 
his videos are more like a cult in nature. So not people in the tarot space may not, uh, he's more in like the occult space. So I would say, but he has an old video about tarot's living beings. So I went to, and I watched that video and he also has, uh, an article on his, on his website about tarot's living beings, a short article. And I'll, I'll link that below. But what's interesting uh, is that I have been um, prepping to do a Deccan walk this year with a, with some other people. And I have been trying, you know, like I've got, tried to gather all of this, gather all of these different references, Golden Dawn references, uh, astro astrological references, old uh Agrippa's three books of occult philosophy, you know, the Picatrix, all these different things to try and have a broader view of the Deccans, how they relate to tarot, maybe how the Golden Dawn uses them, etc. When I was reading Paul Hughes Barlow's article about tarot as living beings, he talks about the Deccans in there and the day and night angels, because there's two angels associated with the Deccans. I was like, wow, that's an interesting little nugget of information. On ter from Tara was living beings. And later in the day, I asked this deck, uh, do you like to answer mundane questions? I, uh, I, I pulled, uh, I pulled this card and this is the, this is the queen of discs. And this is my favorite card in the deck. When I first got this deck, I just, the, the act of the tears and turning into, I, I thought they were crystals, but they're diamonds this crystallization or, you know, creation. And it reminds me of uh, the creation, you know, the painfulness of life and the creation, <sighs> tears of joy, tears of sadness, the things, um, th how difficult things can be to create. And interestingly, you really have to, <laughs> if you're going to cry diamonds, if you're going to, uh, there's a lot of uh, pressure and a lot of, um, imposing of your will on the world here. And so I came over to, the, I came to the guidebook and because I've been trying to read the guidebook, cause I don't necessarily read this deck like in line, like cards in line, like I normally would. And so I, I get to the queen of discs and page 171 of the guidebook um, and 170. It's on, the, I'm sorry, it's on the bottom of page 170. And I just want to read that. It says, the Greeks and Romans thought diamonds were tears of the gods, pieces of stars fallen to earth, or even that they were living beings that possessed a soul. And I was like, whoa, 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 wait, back up a minute. Living beings? They were living beings that possessed a soul. Diamond comes from the Greek word adamus, which means invincible or unconquerable, as diamonds are the hardest substance known to man. I was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I'm at, oh, sorry, I'm bumping my camera. I'm asking about living beings and you're giving me, I'm asking about the mundane and you're giving me the tarot as living beings response. And this is what I was thinking about all day, tarot as living beings. And tarot as living beings in terms of, their, and all of the queens are, are associated with gemstones. And part of, part of Deccan's, are ideas like occult ideas of the Deccans and using astrological magic and creating talismans. You know, you're grabbing that, you're, you're focusing that point in time into an object to whatever, uh, for good or ill, assuming you know what you're doing and, uh, and creating an object that possesses the energy or, uh, I don't know. I'll use the word energy, the energy of that moment in time. And I was like, wow, like I, it's, it's giving me the answer of living beings and also, and also referring to the Deccans from an occult magic perspective. And I'm um, using a euphemism from the seventies. Again, I was like, that blows my mind. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> so these are the kind of experiences that I've had with this deck. And a lot, and, and these are things that anyone who who reads tarot, who, who doesn't read tarot or doesn't understand tarot or doesn't want to open their mind to these ideas. Like these are the thing, these are these, um, anecdotal experiences that you can't really, all you can do is talk about them. 
And this is why I wanted to talk about these two things because it was so, I was like, wow, that's so interesting. And uh, this led me to read Crowley's, and this leads me, seg segues me into another portion of this video that I want to talk about. Now, in my, in the first video that I made uh, about the Marielle Tarot, I talk a lot about Marie White's guidebook. And I, I called it a clusterfuck of esoterica. And that's because it has no discernible structure that makes any sense to me. And this is why I had so much trouble with this deck is that I was looking for order when it was really just chaos. But that doesn't necessarily mean that in in a practical using it in a practical way doesn't work for me. And so I really had to change my, change the way I was thinking about it. And so when I was using this deck, I found it to be, I found that the cards would connect to each other in ways that didn't make, like she would connect cards together. In like, if you're reading a, a single card, she would connect it to another card, but not necessarily in a way that makes sense from uh, that tarot deck as a whole or that uh, structure as a whole. But I still found it um, and very insightful in the moment. And I feel like Murray White is a, a mystic. I feel like uh, her deck was created in a mystic way. And the problem with mystics are that no one else can understand them. <laughs> you know, like you read, you know, like uh, Jewish mysticism, Christian mysticism, or even on a, a, a level of a, of a small group of people who have a shaman or, you know, anywhere in the world, there are always those people that are trying to connect with other worlds or trying to understand the universe or, and they put themselves in altered states of consciousness or whatever it is that they do in this desire to understand the unseen, the unknown, the unknowable, trying to, you know, unlock and understand these things and other people can't necessarily understand what this person sees or knows or you know thinks they know who knows so it's so it's always difficult to wrap your mind around mysticism because it's not a collective exercise it's the exercise of an individual trying to understand the unseen and so this is how I this is how I view Murray White's deck now you know, uh, Crowley, and I want to talk about this book a little bit more, but Crowley is a mystic also, but he, he's, he creates a structure. Uh, the Golden Dawn, you know, has created this metaphysical structure in which to meditate and create knowledge. And Murray White seems to have done it more in the moment. Just each act of creation, each painting was her universe in that moment. It's, it's not necessarily something you can understand or grasp. And this is how I see this deck now, because it's just easier for me to understand this deck now, let's just say, because, you know, it's, it's all these things that, that we talk about. Metaphysical things are uh, unseen and to a certain extent unknowable or, or knowable only to us. So I want to get, so I want to, uh, talk a little bit more about Crowley and, and the Book of Thoth and Tarot as Living Beings. And um, just, for, just for a minute. And um, I'm talking about the theory of the tarot. And this is the first section of this book. And there's little subsections. And interestingly, the last section is uh, the cards of the tarot as living beings. And, and in this, he, and Crowley is, is here is creating a, a literary... A literary structure for his metaphysical uh, structure of tarot and he, he fluffs himself here you know he he talks a little bit about the history of the golden dawn here and about he talks about himself in the third person about you know contacting the secret chiefs and he's he has the secret sauce you know he he knows you know he knows things and um but ultimately he t what he talks about here is he talks about philosophy and um, Kabbalah and um, and alchemy, 
versus modern science and what can be measured and the immeasurable. I and, and that's how I'm associating that to this. I'm trying to measure I'm trying to measure this and it can't be measured. Um, but ultimately these disparate parts these these tarot uh, as living beings these disparate, par disparate parts when they come together create something and to know one you need to know them all and to know all you need to know one yeah I, I, that kind of idea or at least that's what i got out of it if you if you have a different idea please please leave a comment i would be like to know but let me read the last part here this is by way of introduction to a thesis most necessary to the understanding of the tarot each card is, in a sense, a living being, and its relation to its neighbors are what one might call diplomatic. It is for the student to build these living stones into his living temple. I really like this book, and every time I read it, I have these insights, that, and then I can't remember them. I can't remember exactly what the insight was that I had, and then I'll read it again, and then I'll have a different insight. I really do like reading. I really like Crowley in general. But so this is how I've come to understand this deck and um, how I've associated it to this really is just all these because of the what I talked about in the beginning, these little, you know, happy accidents of connection. I've really come to like this deck more now for that reason. Is it a deck I would use for the mundane? Probably not. I know some people can and some people do a good job of it. But for me, I don't think I would do that. Uh, if you're, I would say, if you're a, if you're a tarot reader that has a really strong practice, Kelly Fitzgerald comes to mind here. She's someone who can pull out any deck, and she has a strong sense of tarot, and she sees all. Tar you know, she has a a method. I would say a strong method for reading cards, and she can pull out you know different decks and see what she needs to see in them to read. You know, for other people. If you're if you're a reader like that, then this deck that probably would be useful to you if you like the imagery. Not everyone likes the imagery, and there's a lot of nudity. In. And for some people, it it can be used that way. For me, I would say no. I would not use this deck in this way. Another someone that I respect. I asked someone that I respect about how they would use this deck, uh, or if they had it and if they used it. And their response was that they use it for contacting the old gods. And that makes so much sense to me. I can see it, from, and I I can see it from that perspective. So going forward, for me to use this deck, um, I would say I would use it for a philosophical, philosophical or maybe magical questions. You know, like or for you know for you know tarot tarot card or cards and magic. You know that might be a good. Those two things uh, might go together really well. So and and I think of. Um, uh, Mary Grace Farron, talking about the Thoth deck, made a statement in a video a while back. She said that it asks more questions than it answers. And I think this deck is the same way. I think it asks more questions than it answers. I want to bring it back around to the very beginning of my video series where I talk about, is this a good deck? Does this deck deserve to be on the pedestal that I had put it on so long ago when I first got it and didn't then didn't use it? And I would say, yes, I think it's an important deck. I think it's an important deck to tarot. Uh, I think it's an important tarot deck to anyone who's in, just interested in uh, the more mystic, occult, metaphysical aspects of tarot. It's very powerful. And so on those grounds, I would say, yes, it's an important deck. It's not for everybody. Uh, if you're delicate to nudity or, you know, if you're... Some of the cards bother some people. And uh, interestingly, I didn't pull any of those cards. Like uh, some people, depending on which edition you have, some people don't like the Hierophant or in the first edition or the Nine of Discs with the Baphomet. And I, I personally don't like the Nine. I think it's the Nine of Cups with the with the ape, with the monkey. Uh, I don't like just because I don't like monkeys. And those cards never came up for me here in this time that I've reworked with this deck. So I haven't had an issue with any cards that I pulled. So I can't speak to that just with my experience thus far. But I would say um, 
Is is the guidebook a clusterfuck of esoterica? Yes, it is. Can it lead to insightful answers? Yes, it can. So I still, I, I'm going to say, I, I, I personally think it's an important deck to tarot. More, more, far more important than than the many, many decks that come out all the time. I'm sure there are some important decks in there too, but maybe I'm sure there are. Uh, thank you to anyone who uh, watched this series. If you have any comments on this deck. Or thoughts about it, please, uh, please leave them below. I'm interested in other people's opinions about this deck and experiences. So uh, have a, a wonderful, beautiful spring or autumn. Goodbye.